Hello, everyone. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm Lisa Krasner, the Edward W. Kane Executive Director here at the Concord Museum. We're, we're always very prompt because we're, we're also streaming this, so everybody's waiting online. So hello to everybody online as well. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. For those who are with, with us here in the Churchill and Janet Franklin Lyceum and to all of our virtual viewers as well, um, it's a pleasure for me to introduce tonight's forum, which is a conversation with Megan Kate Nelson on her book, Saving Yellowstone, Exploration and Preservation in Reconstruction America. Megan is a historian of the American Civil War, the U.S. West, and popular culture, and the author of The Three-Cornered War, The Union, The Confederacy, and Native Peoples in the Fight for the West, which was a finalist for the 2021 Pulitzer Prize in History. Her newest book, Saving Yellowstone, was published last year on the 150th anniversary of the Yellowstone Act. Um, which created the first national park in the world. Saving Yellowstone is one of Smithsonian Magazine's top 10 books in history for 2022, and the Colorado Sun's 50 books about the West. The Los Angeles Review of Books described Megan's great gift as a historian and as a writer in finding the connected threads of the sprawling story of the place we call the United States. Megan is a fellow of the Society of American Historians, has written articles for the New York Times, Washington Post, Time, The Atlantic, Slate, and Smithsonian Magazine. And before leaving academia to write full time in 2014, Megan taught US history and American studies at Texas Tech University, Cal State Fullerton, Harvard, and Brown. Tonight, Megan will give a presentation on saving Yellowstone. And in the second part of the forum, she'll be joined in conversation with Reed Gotchberg, the associate curator and manager of exhibitions here at the Concord Museum. Thank you to everyone who's joined us here at the museum tonight and virtually, and please join me in welcome, welcoming Megan Kate Nelson. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was a lovely introduction. And thank you to everyone for coming out tonight. This is a packed house, which I did not expect, but I guess I should expect it because you're New Englanders. <laughs> what do you care about a little snow? You don't care at all. So um, thank you so much to the Concord Museum um, for inviting me to take part in this speaker series, uh, to Allison and Reed, who've coordinated um, the event tonight, and um, to Reed for being in conversation with me a little bit later. Um, so first, I always like to just ask for a show of hands. How many of you have been to Yellowstone National Park? Oh, very nice. Okay, more than half. Did you go alone, with friends, with family? Both? All of it? All together? Fantastic. The whole room. You went on a trip together. That's amazing. That is a, that's such a strange coincidence. Yes. Oh, is it not on? Is it, oh, here we go. Okay. All right. Thank you. So this was my first trip to Yellowstone National Park, 1982. I was 10 years old. Uh, this, I grew up in Colorado, and Yellowstone was the first stop on our first big summer vacation, a driving vacation. Um, and I was there with my parents and my annoying older brother, uh, who is still annoying. And... Um, as you can see, we were looking very fashionable in our, if you lived anywhere in the Midwest and the West during the 80s, you, you knew what a powder jacket was, right? It's like the ultimate in ski apparel. And so uh, we were looking pretty fly on this part of the trip. Um, and even though I complained about these driving vacations, you know, being trapped in the car with my family for two weeks in, you know, time before any kind of devices that would be, oh, there's the audio, any kind of devices um, for entertainment. I was just looking out the window and I was reading maps. Um, it, even though I complained about all of that, it really was on these trips that I really started to become a landscape historian. I started to be interested in what was outside the window, what it was about and what it meant uh, to me and the people who were traveling through it. Um, I actually had not been back to Yellowstone in almost 40 years when I started writing this book, which is sort of horrifying to contemplate. I had planned to go um, in May of 2020 for a research trip. Uh, Yellowstone National Park has um, an archives and history center, which is amazing, and I was going to do research there and stay there for two weeks and travel around the park and well, we know what happened uh, to that particular trip. Um, so for those of you who have uh, not been there recently or those of you who have you know, not been there at all, uh, here's a refresher or an introduction. So Yellowstone 
is one of the largest national parks uh, in the lower 48. I think it's actually the second largest behind Death Valley at 2.2 million acres. When it was preserved, it was about half that size and has grown um, in the years since. Um, it basically has three kind of centers of attraction. Um, Yellowstone Lake uh, in the southeast, which is one of the highest freshwater lakes in the lower 48. The Yellowstone River, the canyon, and the upper and lower falls, and a lot of other waterfalls, um, as well as several beautiful valleys, including the Hayden Valley and Lamar Valley in the northeast. And the germ geothermal regions um, in the west, geysers, hot springs, mud pots. Um, as you can see kind of from the, the detail in this map of the contours, all of this is surrounded by and intersected by mountain ranges um, and traversed by the continental divide. On average, Yellowstone is 8,000 feet in elevation, um, which is incredibly high. You really feel it when you're there, when you are a stranger uh, to that place. Uh, and the basin and the geothermal regions rest on a caldera which we now like to call the super volcano, right? Because it sounds very exciting, like it's gonna go at any moment. Um, a hot spot in the earth in which the magma rises quite close to the earth's surface and heats the groundwater, creating boiling springs and geysers and mud volcanoes. The other major attraction um, is Yellowstone's charismatic megafauna, which is an official term in in addition to being just delightful to say. Um, animals that are physically large and that have symbolic value are sort of wide appeal, right? So bison, wolves, bears, elk, and moose. Um, so Yellowstone really has it all, right? It kind of hits on all cylinders. It gives you all kinds of experiences, uh, which is why four million people a year go to visit Yellowstone National Park. It is in the top five of most visited national parks even though it is really only technically open to widespread visitation for four months of the year. So that's a million people a month going through here uh, to look at all of these attractions. Now, long before tourists started coming to Yellowstone in large numbers, indigenous peoples lived uh, in it and used it. There are 27 tribal nations that have historic ties to Yellowstone today. Um, and so these depicted here are just half of those. Indigenous peoples used Yellowstone in a number of different ways. They used it as a thoroughfare to get to bison hunting grounds that you can see in uh, Wyoming and Nebraska and Southern Dakota. They used it as a hunting ground for elk and for deer and for bison in the winter who migrate into the park because it is warmer than everything around it. There are these great videos that the park has of all these bison just sort of sitting underneath Old Faithful. And when it blows, they just kind of get a nice spa shower. Um, indigenous peoples also used Yellowstone as a site of ceremonies um, and for medicine gathering. And for the Tutadeca, uh, the sheep eater Shoshone, the, the western mountains of Yellowstone were their homeland. Now because Yellowstone was a collective shared indigenous space, there was not, uh, by the middle of the 19th century, any treaty that included Yellowstone within its boundaries. No one tribal nation had negotiated ownership of the space, and that's because so many indigenous peoples claimed it as their own and continue to claim it as their own. They told one another stories about Yellowstone for thousands of years. Um, but it was really, Yellowstone was really one of the last unknown places for Americans in the mid-19th century. Now, starting with John Coulter, uh, who was with Lewis and Clark on their survey and then kind of left and went on his own, in the early 1800s, fur trappers and traders and scouts sometimes found their way into the Yellowstone Basin, and they came out telling tales, right? Water was exploding out of the ground. There was a cliff made of glass. There were just huge, uh, you know, sort of mud pots. No one believed them, right? Because it sounded insane, first of all. Plus, are you really gonna trust a trapper or a scout? Like, they're all liars, right? They just told these tall tales around the fire. So no one believed them. In 1863, there was a gold strike in the mountains west of Yellowstone that brought thousands of miners into the area, and Montana Territory was created the next year. So this really started the first kind of phase of interest uh, in Yellowstone in 1869. Three Montana residents kind of launched a short expedition into the basin. 
This led to a larger effort in 1870, led by a civil official named Nathaniel Langford. After that expedition, Langford came east to tell paying audiences what that expedition had found, the Lower and Upper Falls, the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, Yellowstone Lake, the Geyser Basins. In the audience, in one of Langford's talks in December 1870, was Ferdinand Hayden, a scientist and explorer who had been appointed a US geologist and was thinking about kind of where to go uh, with his survey team the next summer. So I had run into Hayden in graduate school in an art history class uh, because he took William Henry Jackson and Thomas Moran with him, great photographer, wonderful painter, produced some of the most iconic images uh, of Yellowstone, including uh, this painting that's on the cover of the book, uh, totally fabulously. Um, and I was reminded of him while researching my previous book, The Three-Cornered War. There is a protagonist in that book who is the Surveyor General of New Mexico Territory. So I was doing background research on surveys from Lewis and Clark uh, into the 1860s. And I had remembered this Hayden survey, and as I was thinking about it, this was 2018, I was like, oh, wait a minute. That survey led directly to the passage of the Yellowstone Act in March of 1872, and the 150th anniversaries of both the survey and the act are coming up. That's amazing, that's a really great, I mean, it's not the only reason to write a book, but it's a really good reason to write a book, right? You have an anniversary coming up, it's a time to really kind of think about and reassess um, kind of places or, and events in American history. And then I thought, wait a minute, a lot of people have written about this. How, is, how am I gonna write about this in a new way? And I thought, well, has anyone written about the fact that this all was happening in 1871 and 1872, right in the middle of Reconstruction? Which is not a period we associate with the West, right? If we are talking about and thinking about and learning about Reconstruction history at all, we're learning about the South. We're learning about the kind of the South coming back together politically, uh, the military occupation of the former Confederacy, uh, the pursuit of the KKK, the protection of black civil rights in the South. Um, so this then, I of course did a quick search and was like, has anyone written about this in the context of Reconstruction? And no one had, which sort of blew me away um, because it is an interesting question. Why would the US Congress, which is dealing with all of these issues, economically, politically, culturally, in the South, why would it care about the West? Why would they give money to someone like Ferdinand Hayden to go and explore Yellowstone? And then why would they pass unprecedented legislation to save it as a national park? So this was one of the driving questions of the book, you know, sort of how um, can we think about Yellowstone in the context of Reconstruction, and how do we think about Reconstruction in the context of Yellowstone? So telling that story, of course, first started for me with Ferdinand Hayden, because he had sort of launched the project for me, and he was the leader of the expedition. Um, Hayden was actually from Massachusetts, he was a child of poverty and of divorce. Um, unlike many scientists of the period who were born into elite families, uh, he really had a hard scrabble life and it made him really scrappy. Uh, he was very ambitious uh, to the point really of obnoxiousness. He was one of these people who you really loved him or you really hated him. Uh, and luckily for him, most people really loved him. Uh, he got some enemies sometimes um, <laughs> in, in the course of his career. Um, but he found his way to Oberlin. He studied geology there, and he very quickly found out that he had a rather unusual skill, uh, which was the finding and the collecting of very important fossils. Now, you wouldn't think that's like a skill that you would cultivate, um, but he actually had this, and he was able to go on these collecting trips and gather up fossils and then sell them to other scientists for their studies, and that's how he was making a living. But he was very upset about that because he just wasn't really getting rich. And, and he said at one point in a letter to a friend, anyone without money is a bore. So you can see what kind of guy he really was. Uh, so he wanted to make money. He wanted to make his name as a scientist and an explorer. He started to go out with military expeditions that were fanning out kind of across uh, the lands between the Pacific, 
and the Mississippi River uh, to kind of figure out what was there, um, to map all the rivers, to kind of figure out what soil was there. Uh, and he attached himself to those, and then finally he was able to head his own survey with the new state of Nebraska in 1867. And he was looking kind of for new projects, and this is when he went to this lecture of Langford's in 1870, which really interested him, but also alarmed him. Because he was like, these amateurs are getting into Yellowstone before the scientists can get into Yellowstone. And if they are right about what is there, this needs to be a laboratory. This needs to be a scientific space. I need to get in there. So in February, he started lobbying congressmen to get money to go to Yellowstone. They gave him $40,000, which in money, that money today is a million dollar kind of grant, right? So that's a lot of money um, to give to Fernand Hayden to go to a place uh, that had not yet been mapped. Um, he had a lot of help. He started putting together a team of about 50 people, um, scientists, laborers, hunters. He had a couple of, of young men who he referred to as the political boys because they were the sons of Republican congressmen. Um, and he was taking them along as a favor to their fathers and also so they could witness what was going on and they could go back home and like tell uh, their parents uh, what a great time they had and what a great person Hayden was. And then he also hired on uh, the person who he actually thought was the most important person in the survey, who is Potato John Raymond, the cook, right? So he knew you had to have a good cook to sustain the survey on the road. Um, and so he was particularly de delighted to get Potato John. He was helped by a lot of different federal entities. Of course, he got money from Congress. He got directions from the Department of the Interior. He got tickets, free tickets and freight on the Union Pacific Railroad, the Transcontinental, which was a federal project. He got a second cavalry uh, escort, which was going to protect him from any, you know, any possible bandits uh, or indigenous raiders along the way. And he was writing uh, on a fairly regular basis and sending back specimens to Spencer Baird at the Smithsonian Institution, who's the assistant secretary. So he was creating collections for the Smithsonian as he is doing this survey work. But his instructions from the Department of the Interior were very clear. This was not about, the, his survey was not about science really, and it was not even really about preservation. It was about development. He was supposed to go there, see what was there, to see if anyone could possibly farm it or ranch it or mine it. So he did not go to Yellowstone thinking he was going to preserve this place, right? Um, he went there to get famous and to get Yellowstone kind of on everybody's radar so that he could make more money going back to Yellowstone. This was part of his plan. Now he had a couple of talents. Um, one of them was that he was a very good leader of men. His men on this survey loved him. They called him the doctor or the professor. Uh, he kind of let them go and make their own collecting groups. He um, did not really kind of come down hard on them except when it came to packing specimens. He was very specific about what he wanted for that. Um, he also, so he had a kind of loose style. He also was quite a good writer um, and what he did when he came back from the Yellowstone expedition is he first started writing his government report, which he had to do in order to, you know, kind of satisfy um, his obligations to Congress. And then he wrote for a couple other publication, publications, including Scribner's Monthly. And this is the, the title piece um, from that essay, the kind of first page, which you can see has a sketch of the Moran painting that is to come um, a couple of months later. And it was Moran actually who made this etching for Scribner's Monthly. Um, and he was a master of the travel narrative. He knew that people, they wanted to kind of, they hungered for scientific information, but they didn't just want a kind of list of data, right? They wanted a narrative. Uh, so he created a travel narrative for this piece. The other thing he was really good at was cultivating patrons uh, in Congress and otherwise. And one of his uh, patrons who he cultivated was Jay Cook, an investment banker from Philadelphia. 
So Jay Cook was originally from Ohio. Um, he was born there. He very quickly figured out and his family figured out they had a head for numbers at a kind of really intuitive understanding the way business worked. And by the time he was 40, he had his own investment company, J. Cook & Company. During the Civil War, he made millions of dollars, became nationally famous for selling war bonds to support the US war effort. And in the years after the war, he was kind of like searching, right? He wanted a new project, but he wanted it to be meaningful. He wanted to make money, but he also wanted to feel patriotic. And so he hit upon of all things, the Northern Pacific Railroad. Now, the Northern Pacific had been chartered during the war. It was supposed to be the Centennial Line, which meant it was supposed to be finished in 1876 in honor of the nation's 100th birthday. So it was going to be the second transcontinental. He thought if he could get this done, his, as his brother said, this will be the greatest achievement of our lives. So in 1870, he kind of took over the financing of the Northern Pacific. And none of his finance friends could believe it. They were like, that is the dumbest thing we have ever heard. Because everyone knew that railroads were terrible investments, right? Um, because of the way that their financing worked, you had to build track before you could get money. But then where do you get money to build the track? You had to convince people to give it to you. And they just were not giving it to you, right? So he, but he kind of carried on because he believed in the project. He believed that it was going to, to do great things for America and for this region called the Great um, northwest between the Great Lakes and the Pacific. He was very interested in Hayden's Yellowstone expedition because it was, he thought it was going to provide a lot of publicity for the Northern Pacific and then he would also be able to take tourists to the region once he built the track, which he planned to do. He planned for the track to go through um, Livingston, Montana, about 50 miles north of Yellowstone. So he let it be known to, Hay to Hayden that he supported him, and he also sent him Thomas Moran. He was the one who sent uh, the painter his way. He also, when Hayden got back from the expedition, had his PR man send Hayden this letter. Um, I had exactly one week in the National Archives before they shut down for COVID, uh, and this is one of the letters that I was able to see on microfilm. Uh, so this is the infamous letter from October 27th, uh, 1871, when A.B. Nettleton, who's the PR man for the Northern Pacific and for J. Cook and Company, writes to Hayden and says, you know what? We've been talking with this politician friend of ours who's in the pocket of all the railroads, and we've decided it might be a great idea for you to lobby Congress to make Yellowstone a national park, right? So the campfire story that, that was so popular for a while in Yellowstone that like, oh, these like local entrepreneurs got together and they were chatting over a campfire and they created this story of the National Park. No. Uh, it was an investment banker, a politician, and a marketing exec <laughs> who had brought us Yellowstone National Park. So, but Hayden, you know, once he, he kind of got this uh, idea, he knew it was a great one because he knew that if, it was saved as a national park, then he could use it as a scientific laboratory for all time, right? It would be held out of development. So he began to lobby. He lobbied congressmen uh, in the House and in the Senate. Um, he was helped by Jay Cook and his brother Henry, and then also a group of Montana officials, including Nathaniel Langford. Uh, they lobbied to create a national park where the federal government would take uh, land from Wyoming and a little bit from Idaho and a little bit from Montana and they would give it to the Department of the Interior to manage. Now this was unprecedented. Yosemite had been given to the state of California to manage, not to the federal government. So this was federal land taking. It was a kind of new idea. The bill was introduced in December. At the end of January, uh, the Senate debated we don't really have their roll call. We have a little bit of the, the record of their um, debates about it, which were very similar to the debates in the House the next month. And what I found was really, really interesting about these debates is that I think we often think, oh, national parks, like they're inevitable, they're amazing. The Yellowstone Act was not unanimous. It wasn't even close to unanimous. There were two major objections to it, which might sound familiar because they have come up again in recent years, or maybe they've always been there, and they just kind of <laughs> up again at different points. Uh, one, this was an act of federal overreach. 
the federal government should not be taking anything from the territories of the states for their own use. Second, this was a complete violation of white settler land rights, which were the core of the American dream and of manifest destiny. So Democrats were making these arguments against the Yellowstone Act and a couple of Republicans from Western states, right? So uh, what I found out, they, we don't have the vote from the Senate, but we do have the vote from the House, and it was printed in the Congressional Globe, which I was able to see because the government has digitized all of their records, which is amazing. Um, and it turns out 89% of Republicans voted for the Yellowstone Act, 70% of Democrats voted against it. So it was bipartisan, but it was not unanimous. But the Republicans had such a huge majority in Congress during the Reconstruction period that this meant that the Yellowstone Act passed actually pretty easily, um, all things considered. Grant signed the act on March 1st, 1872 with no real fanfare, much to my great disappointment. Grant never said anything about Yellowstone like what come on man um, but he didn't um, but it was as you can see from from just this one image it was reported widely across the nation in local and national newspapers so Jay Cook was excited about this Hayden was excited about this he already started making plans to go back to Yellowstone um, with another bigger survey to kind of check out the regions he wasn't able to see and to do a lot of um, scientific research Jay Cook was like this is great. I'm gonna start building track. He had already made it to Missouri from the, the Missouri River from the Great Lakes. I'm gonna start building track from Missouri, from, sorry, from the Missouri River uh, to the Yellowstone Basin. What he did not uh, count on uh, was that there was another major player in this region during this period uh, who was going to stand in his way. So Tatanka Iotake, or Sitting Bull, uh, had been born in the 1830s along the Upper Missouri River um, into a family, a very powerful family of war chiefs and leaders. Um, he was actually, of all the protagonists in this book, he was actually kind of the most elite uh, figure of all of them, kind of born into power. Uh, but he very quickly established himself um, as a leader on all fronts. And it was very interesting to see when I could go into the congressional serial, serial set, which is also digitized, to see mentions of him just start to proliferate during the 1860s and early 1870s in all kinds of records, army records, Department of Interior, Indian Agency records. He really started to assert himself and to reject the notion that white settlers were going to come into Lakota territory uh, which was you know, this huge swath of land along the Yellowstone River Valley, uh, and that they were going to settle there. And he began pushing back on them immediately, and he pushed back on Jay Cook's Northern Pacific Railroad surveyors. In several different engagements in 1871 and 1872, he shoved them out of the country. Now this became important because Jay Cook was so invested in this railroad, and he was not able to build track and he was losing money so he made the worst possible decision, which is that he started loaning the Northern Pacific money from his own investment bank. And in 1873, in September, when those investors came calling for that money, he didn't have it, he had to close his doors, and this started the Panic and Depression of 1873. For Sitting Bull, this was a major moment. He kind of rose uh, as a leader of all of the Lakota people, started to gather, uh, Cheyenne and Arapaho allies around him. And this really is, as I argue in the book, the start of the road to the Battle of Little Bighorn. This is where he makes his reputation, he gains his allies, and he really starts to hone his message that these were indigenous lands, and the Lakota had sovereignty, and they were not going to give it up, not for anybody. So what do we learn ultimately um, when we look at uh, this region in the context of Reconstruction, when we look at Yellowstone in particular? Um, well, I think we learn a couple of things. We learn that Reconstruction was a period that was about the South, but it was also about the West, that the federal government was very interested in 
exerting control over all regions, and that they were interested in exerting federal power for the benefit of the people. They were doing this in the West with projects like Yellowstone. They were doing it in the South, protecting black civil rights and going after the KKK. This is sort of the high watermark for the federal government for about 100 years, um, when they're actually doing and acting, doing things that act upon this kind of higher ideal. Of course, this comes at a cost. The history of national parks is inescapably a history of native land dispossession. This is something that becomes very clear when you look at the records. Um, Sitting Bull, many of his other allies, many indigenous leaders across the West were resisting uh, these acts of federal land taking because um, they're not just taking territory from Wyoming and Idaho and Montana, they're taking territory from indigenous peoples. So they fought back, they resisted, they are still resisting and claiming these lands, so it's important uh, to acknowledge that. Um, and I think that, that it also shows us that Yellowstone was not only the world's first national park, um, but it was also a place that really represented the nation as a whole then and now, right? As a place that is both beautiful and terrible, a place that is both fragile and powerful, uh, and a place where things kind of right below the surface are always about ready to explode. Thank you. So I think now Reed and I, Reed has some questions, but I think we will, yeah, we're gonna go, I'm, I'm trying to get my little, I've got my mic back. There we go. Can we hear? Possibly, we'll just shout if, if that doesn't work out, we'll just shout. All right, um, can you all hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, well, thank you so much, Megan, for this really wonderful talk and really amazing book. Um, I wanted to start off maybe by picking up on some of the, the threads that, that you just ended your talk with and, and ask a little bit about um, just your process in putting together all of these stories. Like, I mean, I think that what's so compelling about the book and the project is how you're interweaving all of these different mm -hmm. stories of Hayden and scientific exploration, of Sitting Bull and land dispossession, of Jay Cook, the railroads, but also this really significant context of reconstruction. Um, mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you went about you know, thinking about how to, to put these stories in conversation and, and layer them together. Yeah, absolutely. This is, this is always the most challenging aspect of writing a book, but it's also <laughs> the most fun part. Um, if you looked at the proposal for this book when I first kind of pitched it to my agent and editor, it had actually five protagonists, uh, all white men. Uh, it included the Scribner's Monthly editor. It included Spencer Baird of the Smithsonian Institution. And my editor was like, oh, come on. Does it really have to be all these white guys? And I'm like, well. It kind of has to all be guys, because unfortunately, I was looking for women who, I was like, please let there be someone at the Smithsonian, like, and no. Um, so all dudes. Um, but as I was looking into Jay Cook, I was like, well, wait a minute. He's going toe to toe with Sitting Bull in this moment. And then I started to figure that out. And so I said, how about that? And she was very happy about that. Uh, and then we ditched the magazine editor, sadly. And we ultimately ditched Spencer Baird. and and. Ultimately, also, Ulysses S. Grant was kind of the fourth protagonist. Um, so you'll see when you read the book, he's kind of, he's pretty present. Um, but as I noted in my talk, uh, Grant, like I think he is a president we have misunderstood, well, maybe not misunderstood, but not appreciated fully for some of the things that he did. I mean, he really went after the KKK. I mean, he really did. He put the full force of executive power behind the prosecution of white supremacists and got them on charges of conspiracy, interestingly. I was writing that section during the insurrection and I was like, oh, hello. Here, this is very interesting. Um, but he just was not, and he had, he had some history in the West, but he was just, you know, you wish for him to be like Lincoln, sort of writing all this amazing stuff that's really quotable and where you can just be like, yes, this guy's just gonna leap off the page. And he just was not doing that for me. And so ultimately, he got a little demoted 
So now he's kind of background uh, in the book. So I did, but I decided that the kind of three main characters were three good people to have um, so that you didn't get lost in too many people's stories um, and that they each represented something really interesting, kind of the scientific community, the like financial community, and then you know indigenous, indigenous Americans. And, and those histories are very, very prominent um, in the West and in US Western history. So that's kind of how it all distilled down. But it was a process. It was a, it was a process. It was not fully formed in the beginning. Yeah, I'm curious, too, like how you thought about how to address the mythology of national parks, too. I mean, the America's Best Idea. I mean, mm -hmm. and Yellowstone in particular, right? I mean, yes. with, with Kevin Costner and the Yellowstone series and, and other. <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK, we're going to be here all night if we get started on Kevin Costner and his many projects. I do not agree with. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. I mean, Yellowstone is so iconic, right? It's this amazing national park. It's on. It's whenever any of the travel magazines do a poll about what's your bucket list national park, it's inevitably Yellowstone. Like everyone wants to go there. Um, and also national parks. I mean, I get a lot of comments on Goodreads uh, <laughs> that are of varying intensity and. Um, one of the things that people say is, like, how dare you destroy my experience of this national park by bringing all of this up? And, you know, my answer to that is, look, like, I know all of this history. I know all of its darkest parts. And I still go there and, like, grin like an idiot in front of, like, all the stuff and stop along the road when the bison are walking and gawk at them. And I can't even believe it. And I can still really enjoy it. And I think that what tends to happen in our, especially our natural parks, is that the history kind of gets relegated to a small museum at the, at the visitor center. And then it just kind of disappears. And you don't see it in wayfinding. Like, there's a sign for Hayden Valley in Yellowstone, but there's no explanation of who he was. And I was like, oh, man, he would have been so mad. He would have been so happy to have it named after him. But he would have been so mad that no one actually knew who it was. <laughs> like, it just would have really offended him, I think. Um, but the problem is that these, you know, because of that, the, the natural national parks seem ahistorical, right? Like they don't have a history. They just appeared fully formed out of legislation. And that there was no history to that legislation, that it just seemed obvious to everyone to create these. Um, but I really think, you know, if you go to national parks and you have a full understanding of how they came to be, I think you actually enjoy them more. Because it does seem sort of remarkable that this first move was made in this particular moment um, to save 1.1 million acres, right, of, of land um, at, over objections, a lot of different objections. Well, so you've alluded to this a little bit um, in your talk, but I wonder if you could talk about just the, your research process for this book and how you thought about um, you know, putting together all of these, these different stories. Yeah, that was a huge challenge. Um, as I noted, I, had, I was literally sitting in the National Archives looking at these records. They hold all of the survey records because this was another thing that, that Fernand Hayden had to do is he had to save everything. And he had to give it to Congress when he got back. And so we have all these amazing records. I couldn't look at them in their actual material form. I had to look at them on microfilm, which made me sad. Um, but I was in the microfilm room, and the archivist stopped by. It was like March 15th. And she said, find what you need like tomorrow, because we're closing at 5 because of COVID, and I don't know when we're going to be open again. And then, and then she said, I'm sure it'll just be a couple weeks. <laughs> And I was like, ah, but you should have seen me. I've never run so fast in an archive. Like I was, if, if you've ever been in, in the National Archives in, in College Park, Maryland, it has many floors. It's like six floors and they have art on one level. And um, so I was just, I was running. I was running into elevators. I was panicking. So people thought I was crazy, but I was like, I only have one more day. I only have one more day. Um, luckily for me, a lot of this story um, has been documented. A lot of it is in government records. So I was able to find, I mean, again, the Library of Congress has been so good about digitizing the Congressional Globe so I could get access to all of that government 
stuff. Um, and then the, I, I think, and here's, here's the magic of social media. I think I was, I was complaining, I was probably complaining, um, on Twitter about like, how was I gonna get access to all of these congressional records? I really wanted to see you know, if Yellowstone was coming up, if Hayden was coming up in other places, if Sitting Bull was coming up and do word searches. And I had done ages ago a talk for Redex at a library conference. And their rep, who followed me on Twitter, reached out and said, would it be useful if I gave you just like a password? <laughs> and you could use it for three, it would be good for like three weeks. And I was like, <laughs> you should have said, yeah. So this is, this is the database where I saw it's word searchable. So I just put in Sitting Bull, and it was just, and then you could choose pages, PDF it, and save it. It's like a miracle. So yeah, I mean, I know that we love, you know, and as you know, supporters of the museum, we all love objects, right? We all love material records and documents and things that we can see and touch. Um, but digitization has revolutionized historical research and really helped us, and it. I could not have written this book during the pandemic without it because I wrote it from just a couple miles down the road in Lincoln in my living room, this book on adventuring <laughs> and, and Western national parks. Like, uh, so it was a lot, of, a lot of digitized sources. I bought a lot of um, used books. Um, Luckily, I mean, these three men, their lives are pretty well documented. They had some pretty good biographies. There's a lot of good oral history uh, coming from Lakota historians. Um, and I had, I hired a, a Lakota historian who writes Lakota history to read the manuscript and give me feedback, particularly on the, the Sitting Bull chapters, but on the whole thing. Um, so he was really helpful, especially with a lot of the language. Uh, the Lakota language, the spelling and, and the use and different kinds of terms. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you could say a little bit about what you're working on next. Mm. Yes. I was just writing a little bit today. It was very exciting. Um, my new book is called The Westerners, uh, and it is a direct response to David McCullough's 2019 bestseller, The Pioneers. Uh, and basically positing that the people who built the West were not just uh, white people moving from east to west, uh, but people from all different communities, um, indigenous, uh, European, um, African American, uh, Asian American, moving into the West in all different directions. Um, so it's a, it's a much broader book. It's from about 1800 to 1893. Um, and it has a very large cast of characters, which I wish I could add more, but <laughs> it might get a little, might get a little too much, but uh, it has been fun thus far, and I've been able to actually travel and go to Santa Fe and Denver already to do research, which has been like, oh, like sitting, I'm sitting in a library again. It's so exciting. Well, it sounds yes. wonderful. I can't wait to read it. Um, and maybe now we could turn things over in case there are questions in the audience. Yes, ma'am. What do you feel um, is the greatest threat to Yellowstone mm. today? This is a great question. Um, it's about. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, the question was what is the greatest threat to Yellowstone today? Um, I think it's climate change. In June, there was a historic flood. Uh, that took out several roads in Yellowstone in the northern section along the Lamar Valley and Mammoth Hot Springs. Um, that flood happened because of climate change. Um, there are what's happening, and they've done a lot of studies, and actually this is something that Hayden would be really pleased about, is because Yellowstone was saved so early on, um, it became the core of what is now called the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem. So there's the Custer Gallatin National Forest and Shoshone National Forest are kind of placed around it, and it's the largest temperate zone, an intact temperate zone in the world ecosystem. So scientists come from everywhere to do research there, and they're doing climate change research. And they just put out, um, some scientists from Montana State just put out a report, I think two years ago, saying that temperatures are rising, and they're going to keep rising. And what that means is that it's going to rain earlier in Yellowstone, and there won't be as much snowpack, so it will 
just create these giant floods in the mountains that come roaring down, and we saw that happen in June. And it took out a lot of the, the tourist infrastructure. Um, and it's changing the way. In some ways, it's interesting. Some of the research is saying that it, it has some positive effects for some animals and plant life in Yellowstone, but for the most part, it's really kind of changing the ways that animals behave, and then it's also creating real problems for tourism and for kind of that part of the sustenance of the park. Um, there are other challenges as well, including you know, inclusivity, funding. Um, yeah, I mean, in order, to, in order to destroy a national park, Congress would have to do it. Um, national parks are created through legislation, unlike national monuments, which are created through executive power most often um, because of the 1906 Antiquities Act. And we saw what happened in the Trump administration with that power, right? Because presidents can just de-designate national monuments because of that um, and all kinds of other sites, but not national parks. Congress actually has to, um, to pass legislation to take them out of national park designation. So I'm not as worried about that because I think there's still a congressional will. Hopefully that will continue. But yes, climate change would be my answer to that very good question. Yes, sir. What role do the, the Ken Burns uh, research and uh -huh. series uh, play with, on the national mm -hmm. parks with your, your writing mm -hmm. your research? Any, any impact at all? The question is about what is the impact of Ken Burns' uh, um, kind of mini series about national parks um, on my research or just on the park in, in general? I think it created, I mean, Ken Burns is such a, con he's a, <laughs> A complex fi figure, right, for historians. I mean, especially since, like, I'm a Civil War historian and a historian. So his Civil War series was amazing. It really, like, galvanized interest in, in Civil War history, but it was very problematic in many ways. Um, the miniseries has put forward this idea and, and has really kind of cemented that America's best idea um, phrase and idea uh, in our minds. And... In some ways, that series was too celebratory in that it was, um, I mean, it was highlighting all of the things that we love about national parks, but it wasn't really talking about any of its dark histories. Uh, and that tends to be the case, again, in a lot of nature documentaries in this, like, Kevin Costner, Yellowstone documentary for Fox, which aired in early, when was it even, in December, um, <clears throat> which just outright lied, basically, and said that Ferdinand Hayden was, was acting against the power of the federal government to save Yellowstone. And I was like, what now? What? <laughs> so I, yeah, I got a little fiery, and I wrote a review of that documentary. So <laughs> Kevin Costner will not be uh, calling upon me anytime soon to do any, any work for him. But, um, but these kinds of... That kind of popular media is really influential. And of course, Ken Burns is very influential. Um, whenever he, he puts his attention to creating a story like that and creating a narrative, it can become a dominant one in our culture. Um, so I mean, on the one hand, I think it's really great um, because it is kind of bringing attention to different parts of our history and, and creating interest in history where maybe it didn't exist before. Um, but he does tend to be a, a little too kind of celebratory and maybe marginalizing some of the, the other histories. That's a great question. Yes? So my understanding is that the, that, um, so even though Yellowstone itself, the land was preserved in the 1870s, mm -hmm. the wildlife was preserved until Um, so that's a, like an interesting staggered history mm -hmm. of, uh, of like so much of what we associate with the grandeur of Yellowstone, you know, actually was not not protected during Reconstruction. And so, so I'm wondering if you, I don't know, if you have a story about like how how that um, how that later later installment of Yellowstone mm -hmm. protection fits in with your. Yeah, another great question. So this is a question about 
<clears throat> where does wildlife management and wildlife preservation kind of fit in? Um, because it is true, in the first kind of phase of Yellowstone National Park, before a lot of, of tourist infrastructure that came with the final completion of the Northern Pacific in 1883, hunting was going on all the time uh, in Yellowstone. And the bison were almost hunted to extinction. Uh, by 1923, wolves were extinct in Yellowstone. Um, so there was not a lot. There was a real tension there between was the wildlife going to be protected or were they going to allow hunting? And there's actually language in the Yellowstone Act about that, that people could go in and if they were going to feed themselves, they could kill the animals. Um, but that was kind of a line, how are you going to police that in, a, you know, in an area that was really huge with about three um, park rangers, right, <clears throat> to police the whole thing. And the US Congress really didn't start thinking, I mean, they saved sequoia in 1890, which was the first time they'd acted to save a living organism. Um, but there really wasn't even, I mean, there was Lacey, but there wasn't, and there were other kind of wildlife refuge acts and things to protect birds. Um, but in the national parks, I, I believe the first national park that was overtly about saving animal life was the Everglades and the alligator population there. Um, so wildlife has always existed in this kind of interesting um, tension with national parks and with Yellowstone most definitely um, because the wildlife was seen as an attraction, but they were also seen as a potential resource for people to use. Um, and I should note that in, the, in pretty much the same session, I think it was the same session, that the, the Congress voted through the Yellowstone Act, they also voted through a mining act, which is still in place today, which allows people, even if you own the land, you don't own the mineral rights underneath the land. And so mining operations could go in and excavate if they purchase those rights. And so that, the, the idea that a national park would be saved and taken out of development didn't necessarily mean that the animals were safe or that the minerals underneath would be safe. And there actually have been I think there is still now a proposal to use the kind of geothermal energy of Yellowstone to create power, um, which is like, wait, what? But under the Mining Act, they can do something like that because it's subsurface, which is kind of wild to consider. Um, but yeah, the, the animal management history is really, really interesting. Um, the, the narrative of saving Yellowstone is really tight. It basically goes from the, the summer of 1871 to the fall of 1873. Um, so I don't really talk a lot about the, the subsequent years of management and how, um, how people were interacting with the animals. But, but other historians have written um, pieces about that and about how early on, rangers were actually killing bison and elk and sending their bones to the Smithsonian. So sort of a la Hayden and his group, kind of for scientific reasons, but also very destructive reasons. Uh, but now, of course, Yellowstone is the site of two major rejuvenation projects of both bison and wolves that have been very, very successful. Um, and that has become a much larger part of a lot of national parks. That's a great question. Yes, ma'am. So this was a question about military oversight of Yellowstone. Uh, yeah, the military came in in the 1880s, like kind of right uh, when tourist traffic started to pick up because the Northern Pacific was completed. Uh, and Congress decided that these like five or six rangers were not really going to cut it uh, to manage this kind of massive influx of visitors. And so um, the US military did come in. Um, there was a contingent there. They built a fort called Fort Yellowstone. Um, and they managed the park and went after poachers, arrested people. It was a very law enforcement vibe um, as part of the park management until 1916, until the National Park Service was created. Uh, and then that act in 1916 kind of created the infrastructure to bring management professionals in. Um, but the Hayden um, 
all of the early expeditions all had military details. They all had um, second cavalry guys from Fort Ellis and Bozeman. And so they provided kind of protection along the way. Uh, and they also kept a lot of records and, and wrote some very interesting um, kind of accounts of, of Yellowstone and, and what they thought of its prospects kind of for the future. Uh, and they were there primarily, um, military personnel were at Western Forts primarily um, to control native peoples. Um, sometimes to control other kinds, other forms of, of violence in mining camps and on uh, immigrant trails and in towns, but mostly they would ride out um, against uh, people, you know, like Sitting Bull's group that was going after the Northern Pacific. Um, so they were there kind of from the very beginning of exploration as a protective detail, but they didn't, they came in to manage a little bit later and had a long history. There's a historian named Thomas Rust who's written the history of that period of Yellowstone's management. Oh, one more question. Yeah, this is a question about um, once the National Park was created, were indigenous peoples around the park told that they could not come in? Um, yes, they were told that, <laughs> and they ignored that. Um, so indigenous hunters uh, often crossed over boundaries to come in um, and do their hunting, do their medicine collecting, crossing through the park uh, in order to get to the bison herds. But those bison herds, of course, were dwindling. Um, and so that was less and less so over the years. Um, and the park officials and then the military treated them as criminals, as they did um, white hunters who came in to try and poach uh, in the park. And there's still that, um, it's interesting, the, the 150th anniversary has really prompted a lot of deep thinking and a lot of cooperation with the tribal nations, particularly um, the Absaliki peoples, the Crow, uh, who live right on the northern border, and then the Shoshone Bannock on the western side. Um, and those two tribal nations in particular have been very active in working with Yellowstone National Park to bring native histories into the park. And then I believe they, they just recently um, issued licenses for people to come in um, to do ceremonies and to collect medicinal plants. Um, so there is a kind of reckoning happening, but for the vast majority of these 150 years, um, Native people have been seen as encroachers kind of on parkland because it was redefined um, from indigenous territory to federal land. So all trespassers, whether they were indigenous or white, um, um, were considered criminals, basically, in that context. All right. Thank, well, you, thank so you so much. Thank you, everyone. And I think we have, there are some copies of the book if you would like to purchase, and I'm happy to sign them for you. Yes. Oh, here, let me turn it off first so it's not like.